Welcome to my series about all Chopin's music. Today I talk about Scherzo No. 3 in C sharp minor, opus 39. This scherzo is very unusual. Uh, if you, I suppose you know it, or if you don't know it, um, um, I think it's worth to listen to it before this lecture and then come back. Um, just to realize that it's not a usual Chopin. When you start to listen for the first about two minutes or something like that, you you wouldn't believe that this was Chopin who wrote the piece. It's very unusual, technically and musically. It's so aggressive, so powerful, um, that it seems like it was not Chopin, at least not a Chopin that we love, not Chopin that we admire for his sensitivity, beautiful sound, beautiful melodies, and so on. And um, uh, the, the reason, there is one very important reason why it is so. The main reason, in my opinion, is that uh, this piece was written for the student. Chopin wrote it for uh, Mr. Adolf Gutmann, who was his favorite student, and we know it uh, for sure because Chopin called him his favorite student, which, by the way, made other students very jealous. And in my opinion, this is not good when a teacher um, publicly calls a student his favorite student. And I, as a teacher, uh, I never, I've never done it, and I will never ever do it because I do believe that students must be even, and I really want the atmosphere among students to be perfect, fantastic, uh, free from any jealousy and any bad emotions, um, because I want my students to support one another, uh, to inspire one another, to motivate one another, and simply to like one another. And this is very important. So in this case, I as humble as possible, I would criticize uh, Chopin for that, because I don't think it was good. And I have some proof for that, which is, by the way, very funny. I have a book about Adolf Gutmann. This is a Polish book, but, uh, well, probably it's written by a Polish um, writer, so I'm not sure if there is a translation for any language, but so this uh, is a very special moment, because I will translated to English some part of it. And the part is very uh, interesting because um, this writer found uh, quotations from critics, from, from reviews uh, after Gutmann's concert, and she compared those some parts of those reviews with uh, quotations uh, of other students of Chopin about Gutmann. And here we are. Listen, Karol Mikuli, one of Chopin's students, wrote something like this. He banged the piano as horrible as he could. Well, what about the reviews? Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, so German newspaper writes, we hardly ever hear such a delicate and um, heavenly pianissimo. Neue Zeitschrift für Musik writes, he has a very uh, elegant and very soft touch, and with all his delicacy, he has a beautiful, full sound. Well, okay. Then another student of Chopin, uh, Wilhelm von Lenz, wrote something like this. He had, he has nothing from his master, so from Chopin. What about the critic then? Leipziger Zeitung in 1847 wrote, he is really, uh, he knows everything about the art of performing of Chopin. We can say that for the first time, compositions by Chopin, uh, we heard compositions by Chopin exactly like he wanted, Chopin wanted. It's complete opposite. Um, also, Wilhelm von Lenz wrote uh, that nobody after when Chopin died, nobody heard about Gutmann. He didn't play anywhere. What a lie, my friends. In Signal für die Musikalische Welt in 1866, 
So it's uh, almost 20 years after Chopin died, right? Something like this. Um, um, the concert, the appearance of Mr. Gutmann from Paris uh, made this concert extremely attractive because this pianist, born here, means in Germany, uh, very famous in the private salons, um, played a marvelous concert. Well, so this is jealousy, my, my friends, and um, definitely all of other Chopin students were very jealous. What we know about Gutmann is mostly that he had a very big hand, and he, he was a very strong, very big, and he had a very solid sound, which Chopin himself uh, was jealous of. Uh, because Chopin was weak and he wanted to have such a sound. He had a complex of this in a way. So definitely when Chopin wrote this piece, he thought about his student. He thought about Adolf Gutmann. And for him, he wrote it. Definitely. That's why the beginning is so different. That's why we have Chopin who is different. But at the same time, in this piece, we have a lot of very deep message. Uh, we have a deep message and a lot of very deep symbols. This is what I wanted to say. And about these symbols, I want to talk about tonight. Okay, so now let's start. Do you remember scherzo number two? And then BAM! Two questions, very short motifs. Now, scherzo number three. And then... And then BAM! It is almost the same. It is very, very similar. The same idea? Yes, maybe. Uh, this... Uh, also, it is like a question. And then we have... Then we have the first moment which... Uh, students of Chopin wrote that only Mr. Gutmann could play this chord because nobody else had such a big hand. This is a chord, um, I think you, you see this chord here, you see the keyboard, look at this chord. One, two, three, four, five. Well, I hardly can play it. Uh, Chopin didn't have such a hand, so Chopin was uh, making an arpeggio. We know it also from some of his students. But there is one way of how to play this chord without arpeggio, even having a smaller hand. Um, we, this might be very interesting for you, especially if you are not a musician, not a pianist. These two last keys are black. And if we have a long thumb or longer thumb, we can take them both in the thumb, with the thumb. And this way, this I play like this. Even if I can't play like this, uh, I will not achieve such a forte fortissimo like I want. So I use this way of playing this chord. Uh, but anyway, I think that's very interesting. So, uh, once again, this scherzo starts from introduction because this is only introduction. It's unlike scherzo B flat minor, scherzo number two. This moment will not have any uh, connection with what will happen after it. So let's listen to this introduction in its entirety. <laughs> So what's the character? Well, mysterious, scary. Uh, we don't know what's going on. What is this music? Where is the melody? Where is it? Nothing, 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 nothing. But we uh, soon know that Chopin is preparing us for an explosion of aggression. That's what I would call the first theme. Uh, the first theme is evil. Evil, aggressive, very, very bad. And powerful, because Chopin is using octaves. Octaves, you know, uh, we use, we pianists use these two uh, fingers to play octaves and then the piano sounds 
very powerful when we play octaves because uh, the same sound uh, is repeated four times at the same time, uh, like this. One, two, three, four. And um, why so powerful? Well, now, if we think about when Chopin actually was composing this piece, then we, it's, hardly, it's hard to believe that it really happened at that time. Chopin made first sketches of this scherzo in Mallorca. And as we know, uh, he had ups and downs in Mallorca because his health was not quite good, but also the weather was not good, but sometimes it was good. So when he was good, Chopin was uh, ex very happy because he loved the environment in Mallorca and the beautiful views from Valdemosa the sea and everything. But uh, the weather was mostly bad and his health was getting worse and finally they escaped. Um, and when they were coming back from Mallorca, there was a huge storm on the sea and Chopin was almost dead. His uh, tuberculosis and his health was terrible. He was uh, coughing with blood and he was really very bad. So weak, uh, we know it also from Georges Sand. And so this stopped him from continuing to write this piece. But definitely we can call this piece a uh, witness of Chopin's very bad uh, illness, very bad uh, sickness. And now, very important and interesting thing. This piece, being so powerful, proves us that the spirit of a man has nothing to do with his body. And maybe you also have exper experienced or, or you have some friends or uh, family members who are maybe very weak or sick um, or maybe um, disabled in a way, but their spirit is very strong. These people are very inspiring. They are, they gives us power and they proves us that the health um, is of course very important but even without it we can still have a powerful spirit Chopin here definitely um, shows us this but most of all he plays he writes the theme for mr goodman to show off his octave technique and his powerful very aggressive in a way sound um, so let's listen to the first theme now. This is part A of the first uh, part of the scherzo. <sighs> This sounds not doesn't sound like Chopin. It sounds like Liszt or maybe a little Beethoven, 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 uh, because it consists of very short motifs, only three notes. And then we have this tam ta tam pam pam. This is very important. This tam ta tam. I mean, everything here is very important because, as I said already in my previous video about scherzo number two and also scherzo number one. Chopin, in his scherzos, is inspired by Beethoven. And the way he constructs the piece, the way he is composing, is very strictly connected with the way how Beethoven composed his pieces. And today I will prove uh, for you something that you would never believe, but it really is true. But that's a little later, so you just wait. Um, so three notes and very important so that you remember this and after this explosion of aggression we have something another motif uh, which is hesitating i call it a hesitating motif uh, three times slower up down and up down and up so you know like in this prelude of chopin down and 
up and down and up and down hesitating also here we have hesitating um, this is like a um, motif who is trying to calm down this uh, this evil this beast this evil that uh, this explosion of evil and it happens two times so just listen <laughs> B of um, the first part. Very, very interesting and Beethovenian, I would say, because here is as if Chopin would love to uh, compose for orchestra. Um, as we know, Chopin never really composed pieces for orchestra. He was asked by Polish uh, friends and even his teacher, former teacher, to compose opera, national opera. We didn't have opera at that time and Chopin was the best man to do it because he was famous and we needed opera because we didn't have our country at that time. But Chopin refused and he never wanted to do it. He never wanted to write symphonies. He was, he felt his weak uh, concerning writing for orchestra for different instruments. His kingdom was a piano. And maybe it's good because he never wrote a bad piece um, because he only wrote um, for instrument that he felt comfortable and that he could express himself. Uh, but here it seems like it's orchestra because listen, just listen, I show you. What will happen? We will continue with the motif of the first thing. So they say, yeah. but this first it was in the octaves, so we can imagine orchestra, all the strings playing, uh, double bass, cello, viola, and and violin, right? So four, well, four different instruments. They play together in octaves. But now we have a kind of fugato, like a like a fugue, because uh, the first, the cello starts this theme. double bass is coming and together with cello then the viola is taken the team takes the team and then the violin takes the team and then when for the fourth time we will hear the team in violin everybody is playing uh, because we have a huge climax. That's how Chopin is building the climax. And after this climax, part A comes back. So the first theme with octaves only comes back. So, and, 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 and concludes the first part of the scherzo. So like the big A, we can call it. So as you see, the first part of the scherzo has its own construction, which is ABA. And soon I will play it for you in its entirety so that you can hear it. But before, let me play this fugato, this fugue, this, uh, these different instruments. And I play it a little slower so that we can catch all the instruments that are here. Because when it's played very fast, it's extremely hard to, to catch it. So listen, cello first. <laughs> part B. When we have these instruments, the motif is taken from first theme. In the upper voice, what do we have? Yes, I think you know. 
down and up, down and up. So this is the motif that tried before, tried to calm down the, the evil, the aggression. Now they are exactly together at the same time. Before they were separated. Now they are together. Fantastically written. Okay, so let me play for you the whole part A now. And then we uh, go through to part B, which is magic, simply magic. Uh, okay. <laughs> famous part. Uh, before it, let's focus on the ending of part A, because it's also very interestingly written. It seems like uh, the, the motif, the calming motif, so this uh, will win, I mean will calm down everything, and in the end it will, but th this is very misleading, because we have this we have and everything is so nice, so calm, so calm, so calm, and suddenly the evil is coming and again, listen, and again, the last time, the last time, and then, and then we have beautiful part B, let me play for you a little bit. the idea. I think all of you can feel and hear the main idea of this moment. We have melody uh, played in chords which we can sing like a hymn or like a chorale, uh, disturbed in a way or enriched uh, by these very fast beautiful passages from up to down the keyboard. One of Polish musicologists wrote, actually I'm not sure if he was Polish because his name is Schulz, uh, but probably Jewish Polish, probably. Um, uh, he wrote, yes, because he wrote, um, this is the Polish book, so he was definitely Polish. Um, in 1873 he wrote a book, uh, Frederick Chopin and his piano works, and in this moment he wrote something that I really love, I mean the, the description of this moment, which I would like to uh, share with you, trying to um, translate it to English, even though it's not so easy. He writes something like this, there is nothing more beautiful than um, a solemn hymn that we hear, uh, disturbed, 
this world is not really disturbed, but uh, like, um, but we can call it disturbed. In the in the in the in the middle of them, two hands together are playing passages that reminds us choirs of angels coming down with the light behind them. I know you. I hope you know what I what what he means. When we have angels coming down, we have this this light from heaven. Sometimes we have it when we have a lot of clouds and the sun uh, through the clouds. Uh, there's a, a little hole in the cloud. We have this beautiful light. So that's what he thinks is here. They come down to give hope and to give to uh, comfort, har um, to comfort suffering hearts of human beings. Well, very poetic, very beautiful words. As poetic and beautiful as this music. I definitely feel here a kind of prayer, because we have definitely a chorale. And this angels is a great image for a pianist uh, to enrich the interpretation. Because, of course, every time when we play this piece, when we every piece, we need imagination to enrich our music so that the public can get touched. And this is really nice. So um, definitely this serves me as an inspiration. And that's why I wanted to share it with you, because I think it's interesting. Uh, but, of course, everybody heard that um, what I just told you, that, that we have the melody and that we have the passages. This is, I'm not going to talk about it because it's so obvious that I don't have to talk about it. But probably none of you heard something that is here, mm, the way how it is constructed, the genius of Chopin in constructing this uh, chorale, this hymn. Chopin here proves that he took inspiration from Beethoven. And finally, I can show you what I really mean by uh, saying this, uh, how Beethoven constructed piece pieces. As I said in my previous videos, Beethoven was playing with motifs, changing them, mm, but they, so we have still the same motif, but it seems different. The best example for that uh, concerning this scherzo also is his fantastic sonata appassionata. Probably you know it. The first theme starts from, from three notes, a passage going down. Right there. And then repeat it. But these notes go, are coming deeply inside us. Okay, and then many things are happening, 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 and then we have the second theme, because that's the idea of the sonata form. So the second theme. again beautiful it's so beautiful anyway do you find the connection <clears throat> when we have this first theme second theme first theme second theme is exactly the same motif but upside down and of course a little changed in the character be becomes a beautiful melody and what we have here if not the exactly same technique first theme built uh, from constructed from three notes, a scale, going down. The 
second theme, the choral. genius I think when I I mean it's not so easy to catch but when I'm analyzing this piece as a performer deeply and I found it it was almost like the feeling was almost like I would found uh, some kind of box full of gold coins under the ground uh, in my in my land I was so so extremely excited I thought this is incredible, this is absolutely unbelievable, but indeed Chopin is Beethoven, Chopin is exactly like him. Uh, this is very touching. The idea of all this chorale and these fast moments in, in the score is that the chorale is played loud, this and this part, the light from heaven uh, should be played as Chopin writes, leggerissimo and piano, which means very light. So the idea of Chopin is not really like uh, a lot of young pianists play uh, on competitions to, to show the technique and to show the jury that every note is there, that they can play, you know. So we have this, we, we usually we hear this even play like this because I practiced in a different way but you can listen to many uh, competition performers uh, on YouTube mm, this uh, is wrong and it's not my opinion but this is Chopin's opinion that he wrote in the score in reality the idea is that this light is hardly we can hardly hear we don't need to hear all the notes all we have to hear, we have to hear the impression of light and reaching the hymn, the song, the chorale. So we should hear the chorale all the time. I play for you only the chorale now. It's like a prayer. suddenly well, pa -pam -pam. it doesn't suit here pam, pa -pam -pam. but what is this well this is taken from the first theme again it's exactly the same moment pam, pa -pam 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 -pam. so this is united totally united uh, yes so this was the chorale and this chorale we should hear all the time without being disturbed by fast notes to win competition <laughs> but in my opinion and the score opinion this is how Chopin played it himself and how he wanted it he never thought about uh, really showing off the fast technique fingers especially not in this very moment maybe in coda in the last two pages of the scherzo you will hear but not here um, so it's not so popular well it's uh, definitely should be played like this for in the concert but if some young pianist is listening to me i don't recommend you to play like this on the competition um, of course we can try to find some balance we can try to find so that we hear all the notes but we uh, at the same time we have this light but it's almost impossible because the mm, articulation of these fast notes uh, should not be as 
strong like we have in the tutes. Not like this, but more. It's a completely different way of touch. But I love to play this one. So now I play for you. But before I play for you, I want to tell you how it, it is constructed because it's very simple actually. We have this chorale melody two times, and then we have part B of this second part. So, and then we have part A again, the chorale again. So, here you can see that Chopin is carefully thinking about the construction of this piece, just like he was um, doing in scherzo number two also, and in scherzo number one. Mm, part A of the scherzo had its own form, construction ABA. And part B of this of the scherzo also has this kind of construction, ABA. Now I play for you the whole, the, the whole part B. Um, and the middle part of part B is to completely based only uh, of the motif of this light. So it's especially beautiful. Of this beautiful light, this is how the part B is made, but of course it's a little bit different. So let's now listen to the whole part B. dramatic. to explain before I played. The ending of part B is very mysterious. It is like before we had all the humanity singing the prayer or the hymn, solemn hymn. And then this hymn, this people and these angels and everybody is like in the movie we have some kind of uh, smoke or fog and it's more and more foggy more and more foggy 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 and we don't we can't see them it's more and more scary 
and then suddenly the evil, the beast, the evil will come back in the left hand and it will bring us, there will be a short fight and it will bring us to the beginning of part A of the Scherzo, so of this very aggressive um, theme. So let's listen to this moment. Uh, everybody singing. Fog starts. is not exactly the same like it was at the beginning. It should be, because definitely we should have now part A and the end of the piece, like we had in Scherzo B, number two, and also in number one. Here Chopin is experimenting with the form, and also it has a deeper message, deeper meaning, kind of symbolic meaning. As you remember, part A was constructed A, B, A, and here we will have only A and B, and when the A should come back, instead Chopin is uh, bringing us to chorale again, but in a different key. E major, uh, I know if you're not a musician you don't understand what I'm talking about, but E major is the completely different key from what we had before, uh, much lighter. Um, e, Chopin used E major in pieces like Etude or in the Nocturno Opus 62. Um, not, he didn't use it so often, but uh, in these two moments especially. And this will be the chorale again. The chorale will appear again. It should not appear again, but it will. And it will be a kind of uh, triumphal. The prayer will be triumphal, so the good will start to win. But really, we will see. So let's listen to part A um, in the second part of the scherzo and then in the chorale in E major. your eyes and listen to this.
So, what? Well, this is also the Quran, but so different. What is different? Tempo is slower, but most of all, the color is dark and the key changed from major before we had E major to minor, which is sad, depressing and very dark. This is a very special moment in the scherzo and very symbolic. It seems like this chorale has no power to pray anymore. Uh, prayer doesn't work, maybe. Something happened. And this makes me think, and I come back now to the beginning of this video, if you remember. I told you that Chopin was writing that this scherzo is a witness of his very uh, strong sickness. Chopin is composing this scherzo during a very bad health time, problems. And maybe subconsciously or maybe consciously, I, we don't know, that's just thinking. This piece s turned out to be a symbol of fight with uh, sickness, because all this prayer and all this fight between the motifs, the aggress aggressive, the very bad, evil motif which symbolizes the sickness or something that is not going on in our life as we want. And then this beautiful chorale with angels that we are maybe praying for it to have to, to change. And here, this moment, in my opinion, is first of all very sad because Chopin realized that he has no power uh, on his body, he can't cure himself. But and it's very sad at the beginning. But soon there is a hope, and there is kind of maybe not really hope, but I would say I feel here a kind of acceptance of circumstances. Moment when Chopin says to God or to energy or to whatever you call it, "Okay, I agree, I accept." I accept the situation. And it makes me think of this terrible pandemic times. You know, I lost a lot of concerts, especially in my beloved Norway. Uh, if you know me and my career, you know that Norway is now the country where I played the most concerts the recent years. And I was to have a very long, the longest ever concert tour in Norway with uh, many concerts 20 i don't remember now exactly but a lot one month or even month and fantastic and of course it was cancelled uh, because of the problems on the border all the concerts were thanks god they were postponed so there is a hope but my feeling was like this my feeling was when i realized i will not come was exactly and even prayers God nobody helped me angels but here later I had to say okay I must accept this and here I accepted this like Chopin feeling here. Chopin is writing a very emotional and subjective uh, music here. Everything is dying. Dying. And now, after this very sad chorale, we have the most touching, even more touching moment of this scherzo. Starting from the left hand, three notes, so like this. So almost evil is gone. It's not aggressive anymore. And then the chorale starts to sing again in major. And this time, not disturbed by the angels, by the light, but is singing all the time and going up and up and up and going up to heaven, reaching the, the, the triumphal climax. 
uh, and we think everything is will happen, will, will finish with such a triumphal, beautiful, uh, good moment. But then suddenly the beast will appear again. We will hear the dra drastic, the aggressive octaves, uh, almost like somebody came with the weapon and killed everybody. Octaves will destroy everything, destroy the choral, angels, prayer, everything will be destroyed. Then we will start, this, the fight will start. There will be a coda called Fuoco with the fire, and the coda is full of fight. We can, if we close our eyes, we, f we see the battle. And this battle is very, very, very dramatic. And it ends, we don't know really who will win, but listen to this. Listen first to this beautiful touching chorale, and then to the fight, which we don't, don't expect at all. this fight let's think about it a little because it's not so easy we have fight 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 then everything goes down then what we have here we have the choral so it seems the choral is the winner and if uh, Chopin, uh, Chopin should end this like this and the end but no he adds the beast is, is, is appearing. So the beast is the winner. You know this. This is the, the, the first theme. So we have. But is it really the winner? Maybe yes, but then triumphal. But the end, the, the very end is major, not minor. The whole scherzo is C sharp minor, so it should end in minor, it should end like this. <laughs> then definitely the winner would be the evil, the minor. But the, the ending is optimistic, full of optimistic power, because it ends major. <laughs> Definitely the piece is a challenge for a pianist, full of different technique as you saw. We have octaves, we have chords, we have fast and light moments. We have the coda, which is very virtuoso, and uh, beautiful singing chorale, so everything in this piece. Um, definitely a favorite piece of for young pianists, because they can show off everything they have, especially the power of octaves, um, but it's not very typical Chopin. And I hope now you understand why he wrote such a piece and what is really inside. And I hope you understand more this construction of the piece. Thank you for watching and being with me. And I invite you to my next video about Scherzo number four, with which I close another genre uh, of Chopin, because he wrote only four Scherzos. Thanks and See you again.